So um, welcome um, everyone uh, to our first session of the afternoon. Um, I'm Alison Marshall. I'm um, chair of Gateshead Health NHS Foundation Trust uh, and Acute and Community Trust um, up in the northeast of England. And I'm going to be the chair today of this session on risk, challenge and assurance, learning from trust level to aid system partnerships. I'm joined today by two speakers. Um, we'll be um, going first to Hattie Llewellyn Davis, the chair of Buckinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust, and then Dr. Cathy McLean, um, the chair of University Hospitals of Derby and Burton NHS Foundation Trust. Um, but we don't want to just be um, talking at you. We'd like it to be a, um, a good discussion. So if you could um, post any questions or comments in the Q&A box, that would be really helpful. And once the speakers have finished, um, we'll look at some of those questions and answer them as far as we're able to do so. But just to set the scene for you, um, Saffron um, opened this morning by saying she thought that we could, um, if we look back, we can learn about how to go forwards. And I think that's quite a good start for this session. Um, the past 15 months or so has been challenging for all of us. Um, those challenges come with their associated risks as we operate in an environment which at times has felt somewhat out of our control. Our usual methods of seeking assurance um, have been disrupted. Uh, we have all had to get used to new ways of working. But looking back, there's some real positives have come out of that. Some of the working across systems with other providers, with local authorities, the care sector, primary care, in some cases, military um, and private sector. And working in ways that's allowed us to put patients front and center um, of what we've been doing to benefit them with our working collaboratively. There were new risks um, and challenges in the past um, 15 months or so, but, but we proved ourselves agile enough um, to cope with those moving goalposts. We changed the way we delivered care and also the assurance systems that wrapped around that. So as we move forwards towards a world of ICSs and collaboration with the new risks and challenges um, that that will bring, can we learn from our recent experiences to benefit patients and system working across the board? Those risks and challenges that we'll face will vary um, according to your ICS. Um, that might be based on geography, the size of the, the ICS and the, the um, demographics of the people um, in it, the maturity of the system and the complexion, complexity of that um, patient mix. So for example, my trust, um, we're part of the Northeast and North Cumbria um, ICS. We cover um, a large area, we've got 3 million population and geographically we cover from the West Coast in North Cumbria over to the northeast, from North Northumberland on the Scottish border, right down to Teesside. So a huge geographic area. And within that, we've got nine acute trusts, two ambulance trusts, two mental health trusts, eight CCGs at least for the moment, and 12 local authorities. And due to its size, we're divided into four um, smaller ICPs. It's not a particularly mature system. Um, I think we've got a, a long way to go in a short time if we're going to get ourselves um, a, a set up and, and, and uh, ready for April next year. Um, and I think other ICSs will be very different from that. Um, the geography of some will be very different, perhaps only one or two acute trusts, one or two local authorities. Um, there'll be other provider trusts, particularly ambulance and mental health trusts, 
They find themselves working across numerous ICSs, um, all with different um, priorities, different ways of working, and their risks and challenges will be a lot different to ours. I think the maturity of the ICSs vary considerably as well. Um, there will be those that have faced some of the risks and challenges that haven't come our way as yet, and perhaps there's something that we can learn from their experiences. So it'll all be very different, I think, depending on, on where you are and what your particular circumstances are. But without doubt, collaboration with other partners is something that will be key for all of us. So today we want to explore some of those themes with our guest speakers. And if I can just remind you that if there are questions to be asked, um, use the Q&A button. Um, but I'm now going to pass over to the first of our speakers, Hattie Llewellyn-Davies, Chair of Buckinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust. Over to you, Hattie. Thank you, Alison. Um, as Alison has said already, we are all growing our systems in slightly different ways. We're all at slightly different points in that development, and so we will all have different solutions and experiences. Therefore, today is very much a personal account for me about my individual trust's experience and where we've been, what our, what our journey has been. Um, as suggested by Saffron at the start of today, I'm going to begin with a little bit of history. I'm then going to look at some of the lessons we've learned, and then I'm going to look at some of the challenges we still have to face. Um, so, um, at Bucks Healthcare, we're a combined acute and community, um, as Alison's Trust is. And we were one, we were part of one of the first original eight ICSs in the country. It covered Buckinghamshire. So we had one acute and community provider, one mental health provider, one ambulance trust, one GP federation, one CCG, and one unitary authority with a population of about half a million people. And I guess looking back, although I thought it was quite complex at the time, I now realize how simple is that? Then Bob, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire was created. Three counties, five providers, three CCGs, no natural patient flow shared between us all. Some alliances covering the whole patch and more than, for example, the Thames Valley Cancer Alliance covering two other ICSs as well. Our histories and our ambitions are very different. We have 1.5 million population roughly, and we work very much as three places within that overall arching ICS. And I should say that whilst we thought that was a clear ICS, in fact, there's now consultation on changing the boundaries slightly. So in fact, it may change as well. So where to begin? I mean, I guess for me, the starting point of this conversation is that as we all know, there is no clear, clear agreed governance structure for ICSs at the moment. So jointly managing risk and gaining assurance is tough or maybe even impossible. Um, and, I, and I think that's an important place to start the conversation. So it's about what you do within that framework. When I first arrived at Bucks Healthcare, which was about six years ago now, we had a system of managing risk and gaining assurance, which is probably not untypical of a lot of trusts at that point. We put everything that was too hard to solve onto the risk register and never thought about it again. We declared the risk and that was enough, really. So we've been on a journey over the last six years to be very much more proactive about our risk management. We have a dynamic register now, and it's not just about keeping risk in balance, but managing it downwards and as far as possible, resolving it. We aim to have locally owned risk maps for all significant initiatives, again, based on managing risk down. And that experience has been really helpful for us in managing risk across systems and across places. Some examples of what we've done so far is that um, I have two significant examples, um, both of which are at place level because most of the development so far has been at place level. We agreed three, two and a half years ago, three years ago, to have an IT service across all of the providers, the main providers in Buckinghamshire. So the GPs through the CCG, the unitary authority and ourselves as the uh, acute and community. 
Um, we each had different, um, different controls in place, different expectations on accounting, different levels of delegated authority. However, by agreeing an absolutely clear program, we have achieved the objectives we set out. Last year, we spent 27 million between the three main parties to the organization. We've learned the ways that we each worked and we've used our differences in approach to our advantage and to create a much stronger outcome as a result. Um, we do, I have to say, often have totally opposite views on money, particularly with our local government partners. The leader of our unitary authority so, always says when he sees me approaching, oh God, here comes funny money, which is perhaps not surprising. We do have very, very different attitudes and rules to, to obey. Um, now we could have set that up much more quickly, thought about a much clearer scheme with a far better understanding of risk and assurance than we did last time, but it was a good start. The uh, second example for me is Bucks Health and Social Care Academy, which comprises of ourselves, two universities, two further education providers, the unitary authority, the local care homes, the Mental Health Trust, Health Education England. Um, and we've used the lessons that we learned from the IT service to actually structure this in a much more effective way. It reflects the way that we all work. We have a sense of governance, difference, governance differences, but we manage that and that's built into our structure from the very first moment. It's transparent, it's simple, it's based on trust, on relationships, and it's already making a big difference to our workforce training. Other, um, another example would be that we are in the process of coming up with a collaborative on radiology. It's only taken us three months so far um, and it is working, it is beginning to show real um, opportunities. One of the big issues for us though that all of this has given rise to is that actually there's a very big difference by how much risk the individual organisations can carry. So for example, for, for us, we can carry a significant amount of risk compared to the PCNs who are smaller organizations and it's much more difficult for them to manage that risk. But we do need a better long-term resolution than just a recognition of the issue. So what have I learned so far? Um, the things that I've learned so far is structures are not the answer by themselves. We need to build relationships. Um, there was a piece of work done by the Good Governance Institute a number of years ago, which was very, for me, very um, important to recognize. It said that those relationships are key to managing across systems. For me, it's based on trust, respective, respect and honesty, but also curiosity always asking the right questions, always making sure that you are seriously gaining the, the assurance that you need to. We do still have some fundamental problems across, across Bob, and I suspect that they're much wider shared than, than just Bob. Um, data, for example, we have vastly different ways of counting things at the moment. A classic and typical NHS one would be that we each of the three um, acute and community providers within um, Bob all have different ways of counting who's on the waiting list. Um, so that in itself could lead to considerable risk and people falling through the system gaps. Um, honesty, absolutely crucial. Um, we have to find ways of seriously being honest with each other and recognizing what we want and need from any given uh, initiative. We need respect as well. We need to take the trouble to understand what each of us does, why, and what informs those decisions. Over five years, we've built, for example, a really constructive relationship with Oxford University Healthcare based on the fact that we don't want to do each other's jobs. We're now having to begin that process all again with the Royal Berkshire. Um, we know that if we understand those differences and respect them, we actually can build a system that plays to our strengths. And accountability, how does the board assure itself of risk in terms of, for example, we know that the ICS is making decisions about the future of our capital. We need to know um, actually who carries the, the, the burden of the risk of clinical um, impact as, as a result of not getting those, those capital um, allocations that we want. We, um, just briefly then on structures as well, um, we like all trusts now have a lot of operational staff and exec level um, working across the ICSs. I think we haven't sorted out how the trust boards need to work at that level. And while we continue to exist, there must be a system of making that. I guess um, I would like simple and transparent structures. 
I think we need to recognize that we can't all be at every meeting and make every decision. I was talking to a colleague um, last week who'd been to an ICS meeting for her patch, making fundamental decisions about submission of the operational plan. And there were 56 people in the meeting because everybody had insisted on coming. I don't think that leads to good governance. I don't think it leads to good risk management or assurance. Um, so I think we need to find ways of making sure that we have regular update reports at our board level to ensure transparency. I think we need to develop joint committees across the, the system. I think we probably need to build joint resources. Examples might be internal audit, training and development databases. All of those things would help us to prevent things from falling into the gaps, as long as we also have the relationships in place. We need to be absolutely clear who is accountable for what, um, the example of capital and clinical risk being one, but much wider than that. And for me, the biggest remaining question is still actually how we create a structure that our local government colleagues can feel they own as much as we do. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Hattie. Uh, I was particularly struck by the, uh, the relationship um, and the, the trust, respect, honesty, um, I, I think absolutely agree that that's central to, to what we need moving forward. Um, if I can pass over now to Dr. Cathy McLean, um, Chair of University Hospitals of Derby and Burton, NHS uh, Foundation Trust. Um, we'll hear um, what Cathy has to say and then we'll come back and do questions. So do um, submit your questions in the question and answer uh, box as we go along. Thank you. Over to you, Cathy. Thank you very much, Alison. And um, I, I want to take a slightly different, but uh, uh, you know, in the same space uh, approaches as Hattie has. But if I can just share, first of all, that I actually work in a number of systems and in a number of organisations. So as Alison says, I'm the chair at UHTB. I'm also a non-executive at Bart's Health, and I'm the independent chair at uh, the Nottingham and Nottinghamshire uh, ICS. Um, so in my Derby and Burton role, I also sit in uh, the Derbyshire ICS and the Staffordshire ICS. So I, I sort of sit in four ICSs and, and two trusts. And um, the things that uh, I, I've been thinking about is over the last year and a bit longer than a year now, um, we have learned so much. And I want to use that sort of sense of what we might have learned to think about um, risk and, and, uh, and assurance, you know, going forward. Um, and there's no doubt that over the last 15 months, we have all learned a huge amount about ourselves, I think, uh, ourselves as individuals, our organisations and our systems. Um, I think now our memory is somewhat influenced by the experience we've been through. And what I mean by that is, if you actually take yourself back to March 2020, we had little idea of what was going to happen or the impact it was going to have on our communities, on our, our patients, on our own people working for us. Um, and I think it's worth us just remembering that uh, it, it looks all kind of clear when you look back, but it didn't look clear then. We had no idea. And I think you're, many people will be in the same place that in my various organisations, there have been a number of reviews and written reflections that have, have taken place. Um, and it one of the things that seems to emerge fairly consistently is that system working has been accelerated. So people have worked more closely together through this uh, period of time and has probably moved us on in many of the ways we think about things. Um, it's almost becoming an accepted approach, almost. And I say that because if you're involved, you feel more part of it. And there are still many, many people who are not really yet part of working in systems. But I want to give you one example of where I think uh, things moved really quickly. And linking that to risk, um, I think there was a risk we all felt that there would be overcrowding in hospitals. We didn't get people out quickly enough and therefore infection rates would be even higher and it would be a real challenge. So in uh, UHDB, um, they set up uh, discharge assessment units in a way we'd never had before. And the things that we learned from that is that people were empowered to do it. So there was a risk about leaving people to get on with this. They worked absolutely across the system with all partners 
Um, they used an improvement methodology and they continuously improved. And it really led to some extraordinary outcomes. The number of patients waiting in hospital went from uh, in the hundreds down to a very, very tiny handful uh, waiting longer than they should have done. Three wards were closed. The money was transferred into, into a different area. And, um, uh, you know, as I say, patients were, were moved through within two hours. They all went to this, these, these areas and were, were able to move through. And one of the things I was reflecting on is that whilst this was potentially quite a risky thing to do, to give up all that resource, you didn't know if it was going to happen, by actually empowering people and saying, we trust you to do this, we've reduced the risk. And I think it's worth as sometimes thinking about where we, um, we think that we're reducing risk, but actually we're, we're, we're not, we're making it um, worse. So I think that we can all probably find various examples of where by accelerating uh, system working uh, and using the digital technology and all these other ways, we have made massive changes in the, in the last year. But turning specifically to risk and assurance, at the start of the pandemic, I think there was a huge anxiety and one of those um, anxieties was around, would we have enough PPE? People were starting to work from home. Um, there was a huge pressure on frontline staff. And my observations about the assurances, um, given that there was conversation about governance light, was actually that non-executives were becoming more operational focused. And everybody took a shift down the operational path. So the executives were becoming more operational, less focused on strategy. Um, and I think non-executives were doing far more communication. They couldn't go into the organisations in the way they had previously, but I think they were doing far more communications uh, and have, have gradually had to sort of step further back from that. COVID risk registers were developed um, and these, these had a lot of those operational concerns on them. And I think there's an interesting question about whether or not those were set up separately or were integrated into the overall risk for the organisations. And at this point, I'd quite like to find out what other people have thought about this. And we can have a poll, just a quick poll. And the question being, did your organisation set up a separate risk register for COVID-19 or not? A simple yes or no. I think it's up in front of you. If you're able to click on that, we can get a feel for, for other organisations. Um, mine tended to have separate ones uh, at the time, but let's just give that a moment or two. If everybody's had a go, we can see if we can find the result now. The result gets so so slightly somewhat in favour of those who had a uh, not a separate but a joined up. And I think thinking about things like this will take us into the world of thinking for the future about how we manage sort of significant risks. So that's quite interesting. I'm not sure I would have predicted that, but um, uh, that's really interesting. Um, and I'm sure you've probably absorbed those into the overall risks now. Um, so system working, we're keen to build on the innovation and close working. Um, and I'm sure that over time, governance and assurance will catch up. There's, there's nothing actually written down specifically about how this is going to be. Uh, how do we get that non-executive voice into systems? Um, how do we get that challenge? I think, as Hattie says, it's not all about the structures and processes. It's about the attitudes and the trust and, and so on. Um, and I think that thinking about system risk registers, the temptation we need to avoid is just dumping all the organization's highest risks into a single risk register. I think we need to think very system. What is the risk to the, to the purpose of us being here? What is the risk? A bit like you would with a board assurance framework in a trust. What's the strategic risk here? And I think that it's very easy to sort of think you will just take everybody's big risks 
and say that is the risk. And I think that they be interesting to hear what people think of that, about that. But I, I, my sense is we need to be thinking far more about outcomes and what we're, what we're actually here to, to do. I think there were some specific risks very much flushed out by, by COVID over the last 15 months. I think health inequalities is a risk. And I say that not because it hasn't always been there, but it was flushed out. Um, and uh, we know that if we don't tackle this, it will, well, it's just wrong, but it will create further problems in the future. So I think it's been helpful to have that risk flushed out. It's now a matter of what we do. The focus has been very much on our people, on our workforce. I think there's a huge risk um, as we move into the next phase. Um, how are we going to help our, our people uh, with health and well-being? We should have been doing it, in my view, for, before COVID, but it has brought a big focus. And there's a risk if we don't do that. In the coming year, I think there's going to be a massive risk of that around finance. One of the things that was slightly de-risked for us in the last year was the money because it was uh, kind of covered. But I think that will be a, a risk to systems going forward. Um, and uh, I, I think that with the challenges around the people waiting to have their treatments, I think there are risks of poorer outcomes. So those are just some of the risks that I think have been um, flushed out. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, again, we'll have a quick poll on this, is I think the pandemic has taught us that we can be overtaken by risks that we didn't necessarily predict. We didn't really know that we, we might have imagined that at some point we could be affected. We'd had a bowl of various other things, but we didn't really know this would be coming. And certainly in my organisation, certainly at UHDB, we've had a discussion about whether or not we should have what you might call the black swan events, extremely rare, very high impact as a separate risk? Or do you include that as part of everything else that you're doing in your business continuity? So I'd be interested to know whether or not, and we'll do another poll now, uh, is whether or not you have in your organisation developed a separate black swan risk on your board assurance framework. Uh, simple yes or no to that one. And I think you probably people are polarised on this in my experience. Some people think you should and some people think, no, it's part of our, our general business continuity and that we should be building capacity to deal with it. But shall we have a look at the results of that? See what people thought? No. Yeah, the mass majority say, no, that's really clear, isn't it? Really clear. So thank you for doing that. That's quite... Interesting. Certainly, our, our, our conclusion was to build it into the uh, business continuity, but it was certainly raised. So final words. Um, so I think that the, the role now for assurance and risk in systems feels as though we definitely need to be taking a system view and moving away from individual organisations. I think the role for the layperson, the non-executive needs to be thought through. We should take the learning from the last 15 months, um, but we need to build in our processes of governance. But I would say we need to stand back and not be tempted to be sucked into the executive space. We need to focus on strategy. It is so easy to think you're being assured because they're telling you how much PPE there is each day. Um, and I, I thought that was a very fascinating uh, discussion to watch. And we should make sure that there is some independent challenge to avoid complacency. Um, and, and that's for all of us to build in. I think we should use information to look at um, system outcomes and risk. Um, and my own view is that the biggest risks will probably be around our people and maintaining a focus on health and well-being for, formally. Um, and finally, I, I would just say one final thing is that I think this is all helped if we think like a, a citizen or potential patient, because one of the risks is that, the, that we think that there are certain things that are risks and actually they're not what bothers the patients or the citizens. Um, for example, the fact that they, through COVID, were really fearful of going to any healthcare 
provider because of fear of actually getting COVID-19 isn't necessarily the way we were building our, our, our systems. Um, but I, I think it is, is, is really important that we try and see things from the citizen's perspective when we're developing our risk pro processes. So I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much um, for that, Cathy. Um, we, we'll move on now and look at some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, I think I'll start, um, if I can pick up on, on some of the thoughts that Cathy had towards the end there, um, if I can hand this one over to Cathy, the, the first one on our, our list, um, bearing in mind your comments in relation to focus on strategy um, in particular, uh, first question would, would be interesting views on pros and cons of non-execs becoming more involved in operations. Um, I think we probably know your view from what you've said, Cathy, but um, am I right that you think that that focus needs to be more strategic than, um, than, than looking at, at operational work on the, in terms of the, the non-execs and the independent role? Yes, I think um, I think we need to think about what is the role of uh, non-executives within the system. Um, a, will there be non-executives in the system? I, I I think there should be, and I hope there will be, because I think we need that that view. But I think that the challenge will be to keep focused on the purpose of working and integrating as a system, whether that be at um, place or at the wider system. The danger would be trying to sort of go into the into the details that actually there are boards and um, you know whether that's in the NHS or there's local authorities actually doing that and we need to avoid duplication and we need to add value on behalf which is one of the reasons I say we need to think really what what does the system what does the citizen what does the patient think of the risks um, they probably don't care where which organization is providing for them what they do care is that they have good access they can work their way through it and it's seamless. So I, I think there's a lot of work for us to do on that, but absolutely, uh, absolutely agree. Yeah, and we have a, a, a few questions that are centering around um, th th this, this whole arena of um, one part of the system creating risk for the other part of the system and how we handle that. Um, and, and I guess part of that um, also needs to look at, at the fact that we've got our, our duties as, as foundation trust directors, our legal duties, and on top of that, um, overlaid over that is going to be our triple aim um, duties and how moving forward we manage to, to, to sort of deal with, with both um, and how we, we deal with conflicts that arise in relation to perhaps making decisions that are for the benefit of the system as a whole, but not necessarily to the benefit of, of, of the, the people you serve in your own organization. Um, Hattie, do you want to start with that one? So um, I'm afraid I agree with Cathy that I think we have to begin with the perspective of the citizen. And I think the word citizen is quite important because it involves the ownership of local government as well as the NHS. And I think one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is we can't do one without the other. We need both together in order to find solutions to healthcare issues at the moment. So, so I think um, it is really important to take Cathy's lead and say, let's begin with the citizen. I think that's, that's the basis that we need to start from. I do also think that um, we genuinely need to find ways of recognizing our differences and working together despite those differences. I think that's really fundamentally important. Um, and I, it, my, my experience within, within Bob has been that we have very different organizations. We have very different strengths. We probably all bring different risks, but actually by being honest and straight about that, we can begin to have a conversation. 
I would also, to go back to the earlier question, I would very strongly support that our role as non-execs is around the strategic direction of the ICS and not around the operational activities of the ICS. I think we only muddy the water if we start to get involved in the operational stuff. So I think that's another clear boundary for me around the way forward. Um, Kathy, any thoughts from you on that one? I think you're on mute, Kathy. Sorry. Yes. I, well, I agree. I I I I, I do agree with uh, with Hattie on that. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, next question: Building trust and relationship is essential to partnership working, especially with so many ICS partners. And I think um, Hattie uh, particularly highlighted that. What specific steps did your organisation take to make this a real priority? Um, again, Hattie, could I start with you? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think the first thing that we recognised is the amount of time from the execs it takes to really make this work. Um, if you'd asked my chief exec where he spent the bulk of his time three years ago, he would have said nearly every minute of the day is within the organisation. He now estimates that somewhere around 60% of the time is spent within the organisation and 40% with external partners in the ICS. And that's a really big difference. It's required a lot of skill building amongst the exec around how they do that. Um, like most trusts, nearly all of our exec are NHS born and bred, if you like. Um, so actually learning how to work with local authority partners, all of those sorts of things, new skill sets, time. So I think those are really important first bases because if your exec aren't feeling confident, the chances of the board taking a lead is very slight. So, so that was that was an important thing. The, the second thing that I think we've learned was that it was better to go early and try. And I talked about the um, IT experiment that we did. Um, I also could tell you, for example, that we had a joint finance committee with our CCG over the last three years, which was a way of creating that transparency, that understanding so that we did, we could learn together actually what was happening to the flow of money within the county. So I think going early has for us been a really important way of learning and discovering and developing new skills. And then I think often really silly things have help enormously. So we have recently across um, Bob, we've set up a system of virtual coffees for the chairs, the provider chairs. And once every six weeks, we have a virtual cup of coffee all together so that we can share news and gossip and issues and worries and just develop that trust and relationship. So I think, you know, it can go from the big issue to the very little issue um, and they all help in the end. Can I just add um, on that? So it's different, been just slightly different in each of my areas, but um, certainly in uh, in all of them, we have chair and uh, elect. Well, in some instances, it's chairs come together for a, a bit like you say, Hattie, the coffee type thing, but basically a chance to sort of reflect in a, an informal, non-agendered space. Um, in in uh, Nottingham, should we do that with the elected representatives as well? And I have to say, this is how you, you do gradually build trust. You get to know each other and you're able to have those honest discussions. The other thing that we've been doing in Nottinghamshire, where I've been since February, is developing what I set out calling a, a leadership compact. Where they, they prefer to call it an agreement, and that's great. <laughs> and we've uh, we've had, a, had sessions on working that through with everybody. What do they think would be the values and the behaviours and how we will hold ourselves to account for those. And I think it's a continuous development. You have to do that. If you're not having conversations, you drift apart. Um, I think that one of the clear things for me in all of this system working, we do have statutory boards. And I think one of the questions sort of talks a little about the accountabilities. But the, the honest truth is that the changes are going to be made as a consequence of the relationships and the trust between people. So even you know, with or without legislation, that is going to be at the heart of how we do this. So communicating um, all the time, and we've been doing it virtually, of course, haven't we? I mean, it's, it's not been having to drive somewhere and, and go and see people. We've been able to speak a lot. So 
uh, that that would be some of those would be uh, priority areas where I would want to spend spend time for sure. Just picking up on that sort of relationship um, aspect, and a, a lot of that happens, I think, it, uh, certainly in our area, at, at place. Um, do you think that the the emphasis in the white paper on more of a central control of the over the NHS is going to have an impact at all in relation to that ability to, to develop those relationships? I so yep. on that? Yeah. Yep. Well, I think that's got to be down to us as leaders in each of our systems. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the integrated care system is, is not a, a separate thing. It is made up of the of those who are part of it. Um, I talk about an inverted pyramid with the ICS and the pointy bit at the bottom and then place, neighbourhood and then the population. Um, and really, I think we need to make sure that the ICS is serving the population, not the other way around. Um, and, you know, I, I'd be interested to see what happens with this central control increasing but I think I think we're in an era where we won't get full guidance I think we need to develop our own uh, approach and um, if necessary seek forgiveness but I think uh, all the evidence would be that where people are innovating and making a difference if you're changing the outcomes it's very hard to argue against that as long as you, you are keeping you know within the law you're not going to break the law but there's an awful lot we can do um, within those bounds. Thanks, Cathy. Anything on that, Hattie? Just, just to add briefly to it, I think the, um, I, I was very honest in, in my original presentation by saying I think the biggest question we still have is how we actually get local government to own the ICSs as much as, as we do. Um, and, and I guess um, my, my sense is that greater control from the NHS is likely to make that slightly more difficult. So for me, the thing that I'm most thinking about at the moment is the ways in which the local government can use their skills, their, their perspectives, their knowledge, their information to actually come up with solutions rather than just to have them tacked on the side so that they're built in from the word go. Yes, I think there's there's a lot about language and understanding each other's world, isn't there, um, in all of this. Um, just looking at some of the other questions, what does the panel think about the right balance between challenge and support? I um, believe the support is about providing operational support based on the skills of a NED brings to the board, whilst challenge is about strategy. Would you agree? I'm happy to have a go at that one. Yep. I mean... Thank you for the question. Um, I, I think I've got a slightly different perspective on it. Um, and I think that what we've seen over the last year, again, you know, thinking about the learning from the last year, I think that non-execs went very much into support mode. And you know, the very best organisations, they've got everything sorted out so that the, 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 there's a high degree of trust as well across, uh, across a board. Um, and that the executive on the whole get on and do uh, and, and guide the organisation to do, but also bring forward any of the risks and the issues. And that's an ideal, really. You, you, you makes your job very, very easy. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see the, quite the distinction between uh, operational support and, and challenge around strategy. I, I can see where the question is going with that. Um, but I think it's about asking curious questions, being curious about things all the time and, and just asking, I think Hattie mentioned, asking the right questions or maybe Alison, asking the right questions is, is terribly important. But I think when you look back over the last 15, 15 months, the real benefit of non-execs has been providing that support and assuring, you know, and saying, yes, you are doing the right thing and uh, giving positive feedback during terribly difficult times so uh, yeah I'd be interested to see what Hattie thinks about that too. So I would uh, again um, I, I would absolutely agree with Cathy's point that over the last 15-18 months that that role of support has been fundamental actually saying it's okay let's take the risk let's go and do it let's do what feels right let's 
Um, I, I suppose for me, challenge and support are two sides of the same issue, really. You can't actually run an organization without both of them being there um, and without both of them leading to assurance. Um, and, and I guess, you know, an awful lot of what we do is about providing that assurance. Um, so I, I would also echo that, that, that word curiosity. I think that word curiosity is fundamental to what we do as boards. It's, it's about saying, why are we doing that? Is that the only option? Is there another way of doing it? It's about those kind of questions. And I think those kind of questions are both challenge and support all at once. So if they begin from curiosity, I think they don't become um, specific to either operational or strategy. Good answers. Thank you both. Um, got another question. Will the ICS take ownership of the political dialogue and challenges they present regarding capital investment decisions? For example, hospital closures that support change service delivery models. And I think possibly in that there's something about who takes who takes accountability for these decisions. If they're going to be made at ICS level, who is accountable for them? Who, who, who deals with the, the risk that comes out of them? Um, so that the, the risk inherent in um, some capital investment um, schemes not going ahead and, and others progressing, um, and, and how do we deal with that um, moving forward? Um, so um, shall I start on this one and then pass to Cathy? So I said in my original presentation that I thought this was one of the biggest challenges we still had to answer. Um, you know, I'm very aware of us as the chair of a trust with crumbling um, estates around me, that the use of capital and what happens to it um, brings with it major, major clinical risks that we are left holding the baby on at the moment in, in, in the current situation. So it, for me, is one of the biggest issues that we have yet to deal with, along with the role of local authorities. I think that um, in terms of taking the political risk, I think that is down to the, the issue that we began with around relationships. I, I think if you're going to go for, for example, a closure, if you have a good relationship and you can begin by discussing it reasonably, then actually you may do it. So, for example, we have closed two community hospitals within our patch in the last three years um, with the support of local, local authorities, local councillors, local communities, um, by building those relationships first, rather than going in and saying, we'd like to close this. Is that all right, guys? Because almost inevitably, the guys will say no. Um, so, so yes, I, if I can just build on that, I completely uh, agree with the, the point about the relationships. And I think this, this I think, will be a big test, actually, for systems. Um, and going back to the point about the citizens and the, the openness, I think we've got, we can learn a lot from local authorities about how you engage the people. They are really good at this, um, as is Health Watch and so on. And I think... Systems would do well to make sure that we are learning um, about how to take people on the journey with us. And it is really about the provision, how, where and how can we provide services that are to the best advantage for the citizens? And it's not necessarily always in hospitals. You know, we're going to be doing critical care and cardiac work in hospitals, as far as I can see, for beyond my lifetime. But there are some things which we're not doing in hospitals anymore, which 20 years ago, I'd have said, ooh, hang on, you know. Um, so we need to push those boundaries. But I, this is about being open, transparent, taking people on the journey and involving all the professionals as well as the, um, as the citizens. Um, but I think we should resist the concept that this becomes something that's dictated from above or interfered with from above. We need to own this, um, and and you know there are examples where it's been done very well. I mean, Hattie's described uh, described some herself. So um, I'm I'm not daunted by that. I think the amount of capital available in the system is going to be limited, and I think we're going to have to think very carefully about how that is applied, um, and that we avoid the political input there that people want a nice new hospital so that they can say, you know, look what I've done in my patch and wouldn't you like to vote for me sort of thing I mean perish the thought but this is about what's the best for the population we serve and uh, I think if we keep that at the heart 
it'll be easier. Won't be absolutely easy, but it will be more doable. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Hattie? Can I just add a tiny bit, which is that Cathy made the really important point that our perception of risk changes with time anyway. And I think our perception of risk changes within systems, within relationships as well. And I think it's really important sometimes that you throw an idea in that feels very risky and actually over discussion, it becomes less risky as you begin to really understand. And I think that's an important lesson. Yes, and I, I was interested in what Cathy um, was saying in her um, presentation about uh, the sort of more light touch governance that we've had to have at times over the, the, the past year and empowering people to just go out and problem solve and actually reduce the risk by not having quite the same governance structures around it. Um, it, it it'll not be for every occasion, um, but I think there is something that we need to learn from that. And I think I think there, there is a danger, there's a danger with, with the, the, the whole um, pandemic anyway, that we'll have very short memories and we'll forget it all very quickly. Um, I think there is a, a need to remember um, the things that we have achieved and how we've achieved them um, as, as potential structures moving forward to, to, to help um, with that. I don't know, obviously, Kathy found that, I think, can I just, yeah, have, have just come back on that? So I think that we talk a lot about the things that were learnt, for example, um, who knew we could do all those digital con um, consultations? We've been wanting to do it for years, but there was always a barrier in the way. And I think one of the big things for me over this last year is the barriers have been swept away. And that suggests to me that we could have done that before. Um, you know, they were not absolutely uh, concrete that you had to get around. It's not a building you had to move past. It was um, thoughts in our heads about what were barriers. And I think if we, if we forget that and start to come back with reasons why not to do something, uh, we will go backwards. And I think that a lot of organisations have also used, even if they haven't called it this, they have actually used improvement methodology you think of all those vaccination hubs being set up, they were basically set up on lean principles and everybody you ever come across or virtually everybody you've come across who's been for vaccination tells you what a wonderful experience it was in terms of the process. And there is so much to learn from that because we let people get on and do this. Um, and yeah, there could have been some risk. There were some guide rails and some guardrails around things. Absolutely right. But if we forget that one big principle, I think that will be a, a huge waste and it'll set us back uh, again. Uh, and I've taken that as a massive learning. Release your people who are actually brilliant. They know what to do. Um, and stop being so anxious like a parent with a three-year-old. You know, we don't need to do that. We can let them get on with some guide rails around them. Yeah, absolutely agree. Hattie, any, any points on that? Beyond absolutely agreeing and making it one of the principal tenets of our board at the moment about, you know, how you actually get decision making at the right level and empower people just to get on and sort the problem. That's, you know, if we can do that over the next two years, the world will be a much better place. Yeah, I think undoubtedly the NHS performs best in a crisis. Uh, I think we all we all knew that it's certainly been put to the test this year. Um, and we've come out uh, glowing, I think, as a, a, as a result. But, but I think we need to learn from that, that, that sometimes governance light can be a, a good thing, particularly if we're moving into an arena of having to deal with a, a lot of different partners who work in different ways. We could tie ourselves up in a huge amount of bureaucracy that, that none, of us, none of us need. What we need is to put the patient front and centre and do what we need to do for um, for the people we serve. Um, I, I like the, the comment in the, uh, the chat, if it doesn't say I can't, then I can. I, I, I like that. Um, absolutely. Um, I think we're coming towards the end of our session. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions that anyone wants to ask. Um, I think it's been really useful. I think that we need to move forward remembering some of those key messages about learning from, from what we've done,
putting the patient front and center of everything we've done um, uh, and and trust and relationships and respect um, across all of our partnerships are going to be absolutely essential um, for the future. I don't know if you want to have a, a, a closing word, um, Hattie, first. You are, you are mute, Hattie. I think you've done a great job summing up. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I guess I hope people just enjoy the process of learning how to trust and build relationships and be curious with each other. Thanks. And Kathy? Yes, not really a lot to add. I think we, we just need to avoid getting stuck with process and structures. Uh, they are important, but it is about relationships. And uh, if we've learned to trust people more, Let's build on that because uh, it's human relationships that will see us through the NHS and indeed local authorities are people. We've got buildings to do things in, but it is our people uh, who deliver the care for us. And uh, they're, they're really, really good. Let's trust them. Yeah, well, well, well said. Well, Hattie and Kathy, thank you um, so much for your time today. Um, really interesting views and sharing perspectives. I think we need to do this more often in terms of, of learning from each other, I think, as, as things progress um, with uh, the developing ICSs and, and whatever comes out of the, the NHS bill when we get to see it um, and how we, how we move forward um, as an NHS and within our own systems. But really useful session, thank you both very much and thank you um, for those who have attended and listening today.